Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Whatever time of the day or from wherever you join us for this online service, I welcome you. Today on this Sunday prior to the 11th of November, it's our service of remember, remembrance. But it's unlike any previous remembrance service. For like many congregations, not just in our nation, but all over the world, these services have had to be curtailed in number and in the way that they are carried out. But that does not take away from the significance of what we're commemorating. In fact, in this year, 2020, the year of the COVID pandemic, it's made us appreciate the freedom that we previously took so much for granted and the sacrifice that others make on our behalf in order to keep us safe and well. Our opening hymn is by Isaac Watts and one that is often sung at services of remembrance and is based on Psalm 90, for it reminds us that God has been with us in the past and he journeys with us and he is the hope for years to come. Let us sing to God's praise and to glory, his glory, the hymn, O God, our help in ages past. Let us come before God in prayer. Let's pray together. Our God, our help in ages past, our hope for years to come. Gracious Heavenly Father, we gather today from the safety and comfort of our separate homes, joined by our faith, trusting in you. We come with our hearts full of thanksgiving on this day of remembrance. On this day, we pause to think and to thank you for all your goodness to us and generations before us. We praise and thank you for the freedom that we enjoy, freedom of speech, freedom of expression, freedom from war, freedom from opposition, a freedom secured at such enormous cost. This morning, we take time to stop, to reflect, and to remember 
all those men and women who in past conflicts have laid down their lives, endured pain and suffered the horrors of war, so that we as individuals and as a nation can enjoy liberty and freedom. Father God, we remember that you created each one of us in your own image, and you love and each one of us, and you ask us to love and respect one another, to follow your commandment, to love one another. Yet, self-centeredness, greed, and the desire for wealth and power, we often disregard these commands, and it alters our moral conflict leading us to disputes and conflicts and acts of inhumanity and acts of war. On this day of remembrance, help us to listen and learn from the voices of the past and to never take for granted the beauty and wonder of peace. Help us to strive to work towards peace in our world, to live in harmony with our neighbour and to love one another. Loving God, today we remember all that you have done. The gift of your son, Jesus, his life given for us. At his death there were also soldiers doing their duty, men who never knew his name. But from that unmarked grave rose Jesus Christ our Lord and Saviour, his ultimate sacrifice which brings hope and love for all the world. Almighty God, through all these things, help us to remember. This we ask and pray in the name of Jesus, who taught his first followers to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. Before joining our service today, many of you, I'm sure, will have joined in with the nation in the two minutes silence. This is an act of remembrance. When we remember all those who have sacrificed their lives or their livelihoods in the First or Second World War, as well, well as other conflicts since. On the 11th hour of the 11th month in 1918, in the battlefields all over Europe, the sound of gunfire and artillery was silenced as the ceasefire was declared. This was to mark the end of what has become known as the Great War, not because it was a great victory, but because of the devastation and the loss of life. Life's loss, not only military, but civilian, people from all nations. Today, by this short act of silence, we are remembering those who have given their lives in war, as well as other conflicts, which have ensued. For sadly, on the 1st of September 1939, only 21 years after the end of the First World War, the Second World War began. Another brutal conflict that was to kill millions. This year in May, we marked the 75th anniversary of the end of the Second World War. However, despite the devastation and horror of war, there have been more conflicts and acts of terror since. These have caused the lives of many, caused pain, hurt communities and families. The poppy was adopted after the First World War as the flower of remembrance, for it grew in many of the battlefields in Europe and it signified hope as this little flower bloomed in the midst of death and destruction. We have four poppy wreaths here in our church, one from Ailsa Lodge, one from the congregation behind me just there, and we also have one from the girls' brigade and from the boys' brigade. And two of these will be placed in our little memorial garden at the choir steps, and the other two will be placed on the graves of servicemen who are buried in our church graveyard. For as a congregation, we have a long-standing connection with Erskine Hospital, which is now Mar Hall, but at that point was a hospital for servicemen. It's not too far from our building, and there are a number of graves in the churchyard 
of those who have died at Erskine Hospital as a result of their in injuries or illnesses that they sustained on the battlefield or while in active service. Many of these graves are over 80 years of age and starting to fade with the exposure to the elements and it's quite difficult to read. But we have a team of boys that have been looking at this and they I'm going to speak to, to Ross outside uh, about what he's found out about this project. Here at Bishopton Parish Church Cemetery, we have a number of war graves. We also have a number of servicemen's graves, like the ones behind me here. But over time, their names and who they represent have started to be worn down by the elements. So the Boys Brigade, uh, under the, the leadership of Ross Guthrie, have been looking at who these individuals were and trying to find out a little bit more about them so that we could build up a picture. And I'm going to hand over to Ross who's going to tell us a little bit about this project. So this project began roughly a year ago when we were asked to try and find the names of those in the graveyard and identify those in the uh, Commonwealth or who were unregistered in the Commonwealth war graves. So that has been our main focus over the past year and in the early autumn cold nights we are out here slaving away in the, in the graveyard on our hands and knees having a look at the names and the dates and re documenting them. From there uh, it's taken a lot of work to dig into, uh, into the research of it all. Um, most of the research came from the Royal Alexandria Hospitals, today Mar Hall's uh, death records, and from there we could gather the names, the regiments, their date of death, and to an extent their date of birth in comparison to uh, other uh, documentation like their, uh, their death registry. So as I mentioned earlier, most of these graves are unregistered and we believe that's partially because they died as a result after the war, after the First World War. And quite surprisingly, most of these graves' causes of deaths are due to respiratory problems, which uh, we believe that could have a contribution to the gas from the First World War. And How many hmm. altogether have you managed to locate? There's about 28 graves overall in the actual graveyard and we've registered roughly 22 of them. Right, right. And these are from all different regiments? All different regiments all across the country. So from as far as Aberdeen I think one of them is, all the way down to the borders. And it's really quite important that we remember them because as we say, they're, they're starting to, to fade now and it's really important that we remember them. Have the boys enjoyed carrying out this project? I think they have. Good. And you've learned from it? Like extensively, yeah. Yes. Many of these young men would have not been much older than yourself and yeah. the boys. <laughs> it's quite hard to think about that, yeah. isn't it? Thank you, Ross, and please do thank the, the boys for all the help, and we very much look forward to seeing this when it's, it's compiled as, as, as a record and something that we'll be able to keep. And this is one way that we will certainly be able to remember those that have given their lives for us in the past conflicts. Ross is all now going to, to uh, recite to us the poem by John McRae in Flanders Fields. In Flanders Fields by John McRae. In Flanders fields the poppies grow, between the crosses, row on row, that mark our place. And in the sky the larks, still bravely singing fly, scarce heard amid the guns below. We are the dead. Short days ago we lived, felt dawn, saw sunset glow. Loved and were loved. And now we lie in Flanders fields. Take up our quarrel with the foe. To you, from failing hands, we throw the torch. Be yours to hold it high. If ye break faith with us who die, we shall not rest. 
the poppies grow in Flanders fields. Thank you, Ross, for sharing with us all the research that you've done. And if anyone's watching or listening and has more information and would be able to help us out, we'd be delighted to hear from you and you can contact me on my email. We're going to sing once again and the hymn, Love Divine, All Loves Excelling. Our readings today are from the Old Testament book of Isaiah, chapter 65, reading from verses 17 to 25, and then the New Testament reading from John's Gospel, chapter 15, reading from verses 7 to 17. And these will be led to us and read to us by Linda and Des Nickel. Let us hear the word of God. If you remain in me and my words remain in you, then you will ask for anything you wish, and you shall have it. My Father's glory is shown by your bearing much fruit, and in this way you become my disciples. I love you just as the Father loves me. Remain in my love. If you obey my commands, you will remain in my love, just as I have obeyed my Father's commands and remain in his love. I have told you this so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. My commandment is this, 
Love one another just as I love you. The greatest love a person can have for his friends is to give his life for them. And you are my friends if you do what I command you. I do not call you servants any longer, because a servant does not know what his master is doing. Instead, I call you friends, because I have told you everything I have heard from my father. You did not choose me. I chose you and appointed you to go and bear much fruit, the kind of fruit that endures. And so the Father will give you whatever you ask of him in my name. This, then, is what I command you. Love one another. The New Creation The Lord says, I am making a new hearth and new heavens. The events of the past will be completely forgotten. Be glad and rejoice forever in what I create. The new Jerusalem I make will be full of joy and her people will be happy. I myself will be filled with joy because of Jerusalem and her people. There will be no weeping there, no calling for help. Babies will no longer die in infancy and all people will live out their lifespan. Those who live to be a hundred will be considered young. To die before that would be a sign that I had punished them. People will build houses and live in them themselves. They will not be used by someone else. They will plant vineyards and enjoy the wine. It will not be drunk by others. Like trees, my people will live long lives. They will fully enjoy the things that they have worked for. The work they do will be successful and their children will not meet with disaster. I will bless them and their descendants for all time to come. Even before they finish praying to me, I will answer their prayers. Wolves and lambs will eat together. Lions will eat straw as cattle do and snakes will no longer be dangerous. On Zion, my sacred hill, there will be nothing harmful or evil. Thank you, Linda and Des. In our first reading from Isaiah, chapter 65, Isaiah, the Old Testament prophet, was painting a picture of hope. He was given the Israelites a vision of a heavenly kingdom. They knew hardship. They were used to death and destruction. They'd endured years of being slaves, being at the mercy, mercy of conquering nations. Isaiah proclaims that the Lord said, I am making a new earth and new heavens. The events of the past will be completely forgotten. The new Jerusalem I will make will be full of joy and her people will be happy. There'll be no weeping there, no calling out for help. Babies will no longer die in infancy, and all people will live out their lifespans. Mortality in childhood was very high at that time, and disease and injury would not often just take babies, but people in their prime of their lives. So being able to live out a full lifespan was wonderful news. Isaiah also proclaims that the people will not only enjoy long lives, but enjoy all the things that they had worked for. They will be successful and their children will not meet with disaster. And then we get that wonderful image of wolves and lions, wolves and lambs eating together. In normal circumstances, the lamb is the wolf's dinner, but here in this paradise, they eat together. Lions eat straw, as cattle do, and snakes are no longer dangerous. Here the Lord is promising that no one will be harmed. How often we long for this new creation, this utopia, this land of ours just now when we have 
the COVID threat, which threatens not just our lives, but our loved ones. How we long for safety. And each century and generation has experienced its share of war, disaster or natural disease. It's estimated that the military and civilian casualties of the First World War were around 40 million, with about 20 million of these individuals dying as a result of the war. Ironically, after the Great War ended in 1918, many of the soldiers who were coming home to their family and loved ones they were faced with the global pandemic of the Spanish flu, which was first identified in military personnel in the USA. Families were once again separated by disease, loved ones taken from them. Those that had survived the horrors of the battlefield, gas attacks, artillery fire, died as a result of the Spanish flu. It's estimated that around one third of the world's population became infected by the Spanish flu. And it's estimated that between 50 and 75 million deaths occurred worldwide. Today we remember the soldiers and service personnel who have given their lives in sacrifice to our country, to their country. Those who fought in battlefields, on the seas, in the sky. Those who endured prisoner of war camps and those who liberated camps and set prisoners free. Those who drove ambulances and set up field hospitals in the midst of battles. Those who prayed and held the hands of the injured and the dying. Those who wrote home the, to families the letters informing them that their son, daughter, husband, wife, father had been killed or was missing in action. The poppy gives us hope of a brighter tomorrow, just like the passage from Isaiah gives us hope for humanity, a peaceful world where there is no more illness, disease, death or destruction, where the lion and the lamb can be friends, where the wolf and the lamb eat together. Jesus said, if you obey my commands and remain in my love, just as I have obeyed my Father's command and remain in his love, my command is this, love one another just as I have loved you. Then Jesus goes on to state what must be, quote, what must be one of the most quoted texts in scripture. One that is often used at services of remembrance. The greatest love you can have for your friends is to give your life for them. Today we remember all those who gave their tomorrow for our today. They sacrificed their limbs, their livelihoods, their lives for us to live in the comfort and freedom to which we have become accustomed. If anything, this pandemic has taught us to appreciate our family and our friends, to appreciate the freedom of being able to go into one another's home, to share hospitality together, to laugh and smile in one another's company. Family and friends are so important to us. And the threat of this COVID virus is through physical contact. And so we must keep our distance and wear our protective coverings and keep to the regulations in order to keep safe. But this means that we have to distance ourselves from the ones that we love. And this is hard, but it's been hard in the past for others also. We all have our part to play in this war against this invisible virus. We also appreciate the role of others, helping us, the role of the key workers, all those that work in the NHS, all those who have frontline jobs, who put their own health and well-being in jeopardy every day that they go out to work. 
are police officers, fire crews, lifeboat crews and paramedics, all who are responsible and respond to emergency situations and putting their own lives at risk. And our military personnel, those that have been deployed during this pandemic to build hospitals, to carry out testing and to deliver vital supplies. Today allows us to stop and to reflect and to remember all those who have laid down their lives in the past and all those who continue to put their lives at risk today. Our prayer for our world is a prayer for peace, a prayer for a vaccine for all, a prayer that like the wolf and the lamb, we can live together in harmony. As Christian, Christians, we are to be witnesses in our communities and to share God's love, making his name known, to obey his command, to love one another. Amen. And may God bless to us this meditation on his word. We further reflect as we sing together the hymn, Make Me a Channel of Your Peace. Over the weekend, our church, like many other buildings, has been lit up in red to commemorate this time of remembrance. And we will continue to do so until the evening of the 11th of November. While we may not have lit up the cornerstone, we are indeed very grateful to the boys and girls and the helpers of the out-of-school service who have done a great job of putting uh, pictures of red poppies in the windows. You can also download and print off your own poppy to display in your own home windows through the Bishopton Church website. There's also a facility to give a donation to Poppy Scotland. Usually at our remembrance service, there would be a retiring offering, but at this time we're encouraging individuals to give directly and donate online. We're also looking to get another edition of the Network magazine out by the end of November and to try and give as much information about Advent services, which for the majority of individuals will be online. 
If you have any articles uh, that you would like uh, included in the network magazine, please, if these could be emailed to Albert Sloan by the 14th of November. Last Sunday, we had the first of our in-person services at the Cornerstone and all went well. And at our Zoom session meeting on Tuesday evening, it was agreed that these services should continue. Due to social distancing re restrictions, our numbers are limited to just 23. And in order to ensure that we do not go over this number and have to turn people away on the day, and also to comply with the track and protect, uh, we are using a booking system. Uh, and those that wish to attend the service are asked to phone the Cornerstone on a Thursday morning prior to the Sunday. There's also a number that will be given out for those that can't phone on a Thursday morning to phone on a Thursday evening uh, between 7.30 and 8.30, but that can be obtained by phoning the, the Cornerstone. The reflective service lasts approximately 25 minutes and in order to comply with the various restrictions that are there to keep us safe at this time, all those who gather are asked to wear a face covering and to keep this on at all times. At the Cornerstone, we're not allowed to sing uh, and the interaction between those attending is asked to be kept to a minimal and to observe the two metre rule. Those that attend are also asked to be able to manage the stairs, as due to the restricted space in the lift, it is not in service at this time. I know it sounds like a lot of rules, and it's not intended to put people off, but to reassure you that we are doing everything we possibly can to comply with the regulations that are designed to keep us safe and allow us to continue to meet in person. For the majority of the congregation, the online service remains the most practical and safest way to gather at this time. And these services will continue while the restrictions are in place. And as always, I'm grateful to those who assist me to get these services online. And also those who assist me with the readings and leading our prayers. This week I wish to thank Linda and Des for their readings and particularly to Des, who played the bagpipes, as you will hear a later, little later on as we lay the wreaths outside. It was a very wet and stormy day, as you will see, and I'm very grateful to Des and those who took part. I'm also grateful to the Reverend Dr Lorna Hood, who is now going to lead us in our prayers for others. Let us pray. God our Father, we pray for all who suffer as a result of conflict. For the servicemen and women who have died in the violence of war, risking their lives to save another, afraid and brave, frightened and courageous, each one remembered by and known to you, each one a name and not a number. We pray for those who love them in death as in life, a light in their memory that will never die. We pray for those disfigured and maimed for whom war is not a memory but a living presence and those who have risen above their disabilities and achieved so much, Paralympians, civil champions, for all members of the armed forces who are in danger this day, remembering family, friends and all who pray for their safe return. We pray for civilian women, children and men whose lives are disfigured by war or terror as we seek forgiveness for the anger and hatreds of humanity. We pray for peacemakers and peacekeepers who seek to keep this world secure and free. The staff of United Nations agencies dedicated to the rights of children, the feeding of the hungry, the protection of the Earth's ecology the rescue of refugees, the dignity of citizens in every country. We give thanks for charities established to support those affected by conflict. British Legion, Help for Heroes, Erskine Hospital, Poppy Scotland. 
and we pray for all who bear the burden and privilege of leadership. Our Queen and her governments here in Scotland and Westminster. Especially at this time of pandemic when there is so much insecurity, so much worry, so much fear. And we pray for those in our military and in our churches who seek to give leadership and guidance at this time. We ask for all gifts of wisdom and resolve in the search for reconciliation and peace. And as we honour the past, may we put our faith in your future, for you are the source of life and hope, that the day may come when we shall forge swords into ploughshares and spears into pruning knives, that nation shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war any more. In the name of Christ, the Prince of Peace. Amen. Just after the benediction, if you continue watching, you'll be able to see the laying of the wreaths as we would do outside. Our closing hymn today is 468, Son of God, Eternal Father.
May the love of Christ shine in and through us. May the peace of Christ dwell in our hearts. And the blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be with each one of you this day and evermore. Amen. God bless. Stay safe. Thank <laughs> you.